All right, uh, are we ready? Yeah, we're ready. So um, this is, a, I have some slides I put together over the weekend and today. I'm not really happy with them and this, there was a lot of issues, but I figured it's, it's still worth going through. And, and, um, and I think as we go, I'd like feedback. Uh, if I'm going too slow and you say, yeah, we know all this already, Jeff, don't do it again, tell me. Or if you say, I have no idea what you're talking about, tell me that too. Um, the, it, it's basically following up on uh, what we talked about last week when Subutai went over the, the poster that he did uh, with Carmen um, about the, 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 the routing mechanism in the thalamus. And then there was a couple of uh, Slack posts I put about that, how that, you know, how we, how that could be used for um, uh, reference frame transformations in the cortex. And so um, I'm just going to talk about that issue um, and talk about some of the issues related to it. And so the, it's a, I called this a proposal and exploration because I'm not, not proposing this is the way it works. This is just like, hey, here's an idea. Uh, had some really nice, it has some really nice actions, but I don't know if it's right or not. Um, I, I think there's some right things to it, but I'm, I'm really kind of confused by it. And the proposal is essentially that the thalamus, at least what we're talking about, the, what they call the relay cells or the thalamocortical cells in the thalamus, um, are performing reference rate transformations. And that's what they're doing primarily. Um, and so uh, that's the topic, you know, is that possible? And uh, why do we think that might be happening? And what would be the issues associated with it? Um, any questions before I delve into it? All right, we're gonna go now. Some of the material, a lot of the material here is gonna be very familiar to some people, but some people are gonna, it's probably gonna be new to them. I can't really keep track of who's, who knows what <laughs> and how much people understand. So again, any feedback on um, like, like the pace or don't need, don't need to do this again, Jeff, let me know. Um, so it's been known for a long time that the, court, the brain has to do reference frame transformations. This is not a new idea. Um, I guess it's been sort of a general thought like, hey, yeah, you know, we have bodies in the world and we're moving about in the world. And therefore, as we manipulate objects in the world, we have to, we have to do these transforms between our, the body-centric reference frames and, and the reference frames in the world. And the thousand brain theories is more specific about that. The thousand brain theory says that every cortical column must be doing reference frame transformations. Um, so it's, it's, it could be help happening elsewhere in the brain too. I'm not saying it's not helping in some sort, it could be happening in many subcortical structures, but it's gonna be happening in the cortex and specifically in every cortical column. And the reason we say that is that, you know, that the thousand brain theory says every column learns sensory motor models of objects in the world. And again, I use the word objects. Um, you can think of them as physical objects like a coffee cup, but it could be any kind of structure that exists in the world. And then to learn a model, uh, a sensory motor model, the column must get two types of inputs. It has to get one type of input, which is representing what a sensor is actually sensing, what is, uh, what is the, the details I'm sensing at this moment in time. And the other thing it has to know is how the sensor is moving. Um, and it's only by combining the movement and knowledge about the movement and which direction some, the sensor is moving and what it's sensing can you build up the sort of the structure of the world, a model of the structural world. Uh, and because the object being modeled in the sensory system may be at different orientations or different poses relative to each other, um, the columns must transform a sense and movement data to be aligned with the object. Um, so the example we've often used, um, I'll just talk about, it. I'll stop sharing for a second here, is, you know, we talked about the coffee cup in the paper and staplers and things like that, you know, where your finger is at some orientation to the cup. And, and, and when you move your finger, where it moves onto the cup depends on the orientation of the cup. And what you feel depends on the orientation of the finger on the cup. It's interesting, this happens even in all the time, even something simple as like, if you look at every one of these pictures right now, uh, often our heads are tilted 10 degrees one way or the other. And, um, you know, and that means that if I'm like reading a book or something like that, that eye movements required to, to read a line of text in the book are different depending if my head's tilting one way or the other way. And there's a, there's a transformation that has to occur there. I can't just say to, to read a line of text, move my eyes to the right. No, I have to sometimes move in different directions and so on. Um, so there's, that's another example uh, of what's going on uh, in, um, uh, it's just constant. If you think about it, you'll realize that this is happening all over the place. Okay, back to the presentation here. Um, uh, share, there we go. So, um, why did I stop losing my ability? Here we go. So, um, 
the general theme here is the inputs to every cortical column pass through the thalamus. So the question we want to ask is, could the, th to the, thalamic, the thalamic cortical relay cells in the thalamus be doing a reference frame conversion? Could they be converting the, an input from one reference frame to another? And so um, that's the thing I'm going to uh, talk about. I'm going to start with a little teeny bit of, uh, just, just to remind you, I've been talking about this before. Um, this is a slide I presented sometime in the last few months. I'm not sure when. Um, uh, where I was talking about how these reference frame transformations could be occurring in different layers within the cortical column. So this picture was a, a presentation, part of a presentation I gave earlier. I'm talking about the cortical column. And I was talking about the different representations, simple cells and complex cells, and how uh, it's possible perhaps some of these layers are representing allocentric movement and some of them are representing mesocentric movement, and there will be a transformation going back and forth between them. Uh, I haven't abandoned this idea completely, but to, just, just to put in perspective, today I'm going to talk about a different approach for doing this um, that would be an alternate to this uh, type of thinking here. So it's, we're still trying to figure out how this happens. So in this case, we're going to go look at the, the thalamus. And this is a little bit of review of what uh, Tsubutai showed last week, that the traditional way of thinking about the thalamus is, is that it was a, as a gateway into the cortex. So information would come from a sensor. I hope you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, yeah. we can. So information comes from a, sen a sensor. It goes through the thalamus. Um, it then goes to the cortex into layer four, then layer three in, the, in a region would project to layer four in the next region, layer three would project in the next region. And this would be the, this is the classic feed forward pathway. Um, in this case, the, the thalamus is just an entryway you know, into the cortex. And um, we think about those three um, sort of well-known subdivisions of the thalamus, uh, LGN representing where the visual input comes in, MGN representing auditory input, and BPN representing somatic sensory input. Um, so, um, so the idea here is that information is passing uh, directly from region to region. Um, and the reason they, they call the thalamus as a relay is because they often could see that one spike into the thalamus from the sensor could lead to one spike out. Um, I mean, it's, it really, you could, you're, you're on the right conditions, you're, you're, uh, you can detect the tiniest little bit of light and it's just one spike in your cognitive of that. Um, it was known when they drew these kind of diagrams that there were many other cortical cortical connections, and there were also many other connections between the cortex and the thalamus, and they're not shown here. But no one knew what they were; they weren't well characterized. So people just sort of said, "Yeah, there's other parts of the thalamus that there's, there's some kind of loops between the cortex and the thalamus," but it was generally ignored. And you can see that in this famous Feldman Vanessen diagram, where um, this is in you know 1991, where this this is really the, became the sort of the the, the standard of how we think about cortical uh, flow. And here they show the retina, this first block at the bottom. They show, this is the visual cortex of a monkey. They show LGN, that's the thalamus here. And then this is V1, this next purpley thing. Uh, and after that, all these connections are cortical, cortical. There's no other thalamic interaction shown here at all. No other connections to the thalamus. Uh, but then Sherman and Guillory, again, re repeating what, what Subutai said last week. Um, Sherman and Guillory, uh, had proposed a different alternate explanation or an alternate architecture. In their world, feed forward uh, pathway primarily goes through the thalamus each time. So you have a sensor which goes to what they call a first order thalamic relay, it goes to layer four, then layer five is being an output of the cort cort cortical region, um, goes fed into the higher order thalamic relay, which becomes input to layer four, which goes to layer five and so on. And so there's this constant, the feed flow pathway goes through the thalamic relay cells every time. In this situation, it's well known that these layer five cells uh, that project to the thalamus split, their axons split in two, and um, they project someplace below the cortex that's generating motor. So they, these are the motor output cells of the cortex. And so this would say like, well, what's being passed between region one and region two is a motor command. It's a motor command being sent through the thalamus. But over here, you see, in the we say, well, there's this input from the sensor that's being passed to the thalamus. Well, that seems kind of weird. Um, if we think about it, um, in this scenario, the thalamus processes feed forward input to all cortical regions, not just the first region. But then there's this weird thing. Like I just said, the first order thalamic um, relay passes sensory data, and the high order ones are passing motor commands. This is, clearly can't be right. Um, it's, it's asymmetrical. It doesn't make any sense. And this bothered me for many years. Uh, something's wrong about this picture. Uh, we can't have one region processing sensory data and another region processing motor data. 
And a thousand brain theory says every column needs input, both sense and motor data. And so, you know, and they also, every column has to have a motor output. These are the three things we know that a column has to do. They have to have an input from the sensor, an input that represents movement or motor data, and it also has to generate behaviors. Well, in this picture here, we see that every column or every region has cells that project and create motor outputs. That's good, that these layer five cells. But in here we're showing that this thing is getting sensor and this is getting motor. So this is not, something's wrong here. This can't be right. Um, then um, what got me down this path of thinking, uh, what I'm gonna explore further, and this is a, a slide I showed earlier too, uh, at least parts of the slide. I was making the observation that if you're watching a, um, so again, this is a repeat for some people, if you're looking at a, a, a first person a role playing game, like imagine this, someone's marching through some environment here and I'm just watching it, I'm not controlling it, right? I'm just watching someone play this game. Um, uh, I can tell just by looking at this, what's go, what the agent is doing. I can tell if the agent is turning left or right. I can tell if the agent is going forward or backwards. I can tell if the agent's looking up or down. I can tell if the agent's moving sideways, left or right. I can even tell if the agent's moving in a circle, you know, circling an adversary. Um, I can also tell if, if the objects in the environment are moving relative, you know, to the environment. All this is coming through purely sensory data. That is, we used to think that the, the only way to know what the, what the body is doing is through a, what they call an efference motor command. Like I'd have a signal telling me how I'm acting and, and then the cortex could use that, which is still true. But this says, I don't have to have that, you know, in terms of vision, at least. Um, I can determine all the movements that an agent is doing just by looking at the, the visual input. And I don't need a motor efference copy. Um, and so when you think about this, and I've thought about this quite a bit, everything you need to know um, uh, how the sensor is moving in the world is available by observing relative flow patterns. Um, and so, and these relative flow patterns must, these flow patterns must be present in the optic nerve. Otherwise you couldn't do this task. You couldn't see what was going on. And when I say relative flow patterns, if you think about what's the difference between all these different types of actions one can take, the only difference between turning left and, and going forward or looking up or drawing side or the circling anniversary and so on, the only difference is how flow bits, or how flow is changing in relative in different parts of the scene. And sometimes it'll be going forward, there'd be a flow bits moving to the right on the right side and to the left on the left side type of thing. But if you're turning left, they're all moving one way. And it's a relative, um, flow that determines how you can see all these things and just intuitively know what's going on. There's, there's no thinking involved at all. Just you just automatically know how the object is moving. So therefore the cortex can learn what movements are possible and uh, which are being executed by observing how flow patterns in, by observing flow patterns in the sensory data. So now we come back to our, uh, and this is, I showed one of these diagrams previously and I've just got two similar, these two diagrams are really showing the same thing, just two different ways of looking at it. Um, and, and so um, what's really nice about this is there are two different types of sensory data coming from the retina. Uh, there are these parvocellular and, and magnocellular cells and uh, they're segregated in the thalamus. That is, they're not mixed in the thalamus. So these, this picture shows the thalamus here. This is the thalamus down here as well. And that there's layers in the thalamus that are segregating the, in the kids take the pink of the parvocellular cells and the blue are the magnocellular cells. And, they have different distributions on the eyes too. The parvocellular cells are primarily in the fovea in the very center, the magnocellular cells are all around. And the magnocellular cells are ideal for, um, for doing flow detection. They have very fast response, they have broad receptive fields. Um, they, there's no tonic response, meaning that if they only fire when something is changing um, and they don't involve color. And so they're ideal for flow detection. And whereas the parvocellular cells are the opposite. They have a slower response uh, they have narrow receptive fields. They have a tonic response, meaning if I show you an image, they will continue to fire even though its image is still. They do represent color. And so these are ideal for feature detection. So the idea now is we have two types of input from the, from the retina to the, to the cortex. And um, uh, one's gonna be used for flow detection and the other's gonna be used for uh, feature detection. Uh, just pointing out for completeness, there's these cony cellular, cellular layers here, which are very uh, poorly understood. And they might actually represent um, true motor efference copy commands, because I think the superior colliculus, which is the motor center for the, for the eyes, um, projects to these cornicellular cells. So there actually might be a true efference copy motor command going through the cornicellular cells, but that's very speculative. So now let's look at the, um, 
let's just look at the, um, I'm sorry, look at the, let's look at the, the, a more detailed view of what's going on in the cortex. Um, and um, so this is all pretty well uh, known. This is, I'm not making any of this up here. Um, first of all, now on the left here, I show in, uh, it's all V1. So we're talking about, this is gonna be LGN here. We're just talking about, uh, excuse me, all vision we're talking about now. So we have the retina, we have these two pathways, the parvocellular and the magnocellular pathways. They go into the thalamus individually. They're maintained separate in the thalamus and then they leave separate from the thalamus and they project to the cortex. It's not known how, what happens at this point, how they're mixed or not mixed. That is not known as far as I, I've been, haven't been able to find out. I've asked people, no one seems to know. So we don't know what mixing is going on here, if there can main segregation or not. We do know though that when the input goes to the cortex, a cortical uh, column or, or region, there is not just to layer four, there's three separate areas that receive input from the thalamus. One is in lower layer five and one is in lower layer three. Uh, there are more cells projecting to layer four. So that's the one that people talk about. Um, but these are separate inputs and, um, and they independently drive these cells. So even if layer four is disabled, these layer B cells will respond. And then we've talked about this quite a bit that these, these are complex cells and simple cells and complex cells. Complex cells are cells that respond to movement. Um, simple cells do not. They're, they are basically just sort of pattern mechanizers. And, and I showed some old literature in the, that where the complex cells they, they're described as like, oh, a line moving to the right or a line moving to the left, that's what makes these cells respond. But the, the actual, the, the, actually that's not true. They respond to flow, anything moving to the right and anything moving to the left makes the complex cells respond. So we're here, we've got this sort of segregation going on, which is really uh, great for what we need. We have basically these complex cells are representing movement and, and the simple cells are not rep they're representing uh, what is being sensed. Um, and the blue thing here is, is uh, also we've talked quite a bit about these layer 6A cells, which project to the thalamus and presumably control the thalamus. They control whatever the thalamus is doing. Uh, and these are massive projections, meaning many, many cells uh, uh, project back. Uh, but also those same layer 6A cells project to layer 4, which is kind of interesting. We've talked about that in our papers, but this is a little problematic in this case because this tells me that whatever this, these cells are telling the thalamus to do, they're also telling something to layer 4. Uh, which I don't quite understand completely right now. So this is a more complete picture of what's going on. Uh, even though it's not complete, we don't really understand it. And of course, there's many other connections like our voting connections we've talked about from other layers that go across cortical cortical connections. There are a lot of cortical cortical connections, but this is basically representing sort of the feed flow or flow into the cortex from region to region. Um, in this case, the output of a, of a V1 uh, uh, layer five cell in a region, these project to the superior colliculus, which is the old motor center for, for many parts of the, the body, but especially for the eyes. So in the sense that e these cells in V1 and V2 are able to control eye movement. So we have, we have movement information coming in on the magnus of the cells. We have uh, details, uh, uh, retinal information coming in on part of the cells. Um, they're, they're maintained. We now have flow data going on in the cortex, and and then uh, we have an output motor command which is coming back. So we have we now have all of our pieces. Um, we don't know what's going on. Excuse, I don't know what's going on in these higher order oops, um, these higher order relay cells, uh, thalamic centers. Here, whether there's something equivalent to parvo and magna. So there, that's not known. But I can make it work either way. So it's confusing. Um, now, as, as Subutai talked last week, and we've had a lot of discussions over the past few years, the anatomy and physiology of the thalamus, and has this very detailed and unusual anatomy and physiology, suggests that the thalamic pharmacortical relay cells, the cells in the thalamus that project to the cortex, um, might be implementing a multiplexer. And um, it, that we, just, we just looked at the cells and, and, and that's what you can sort of deduce. It's also comes about the fact that the idea that these cells are, you know, one spike in and one spike out, well, that doesn't seem like they're doing much, does it? Um, but that would make a lot of sense if you're trying to multiplex where that spike went to. You could say, oh, one, cell, one spike comes in, but it might go out in a different direction <laughs> on a different cell. So we, we spent a lot of time thinking about that, whether that could be what's going on, because the thalamus is clearly essential to everything going on in the cortex, and it needs to have an important role and so we were trying to figure out what it might do. So now we have, okay, we have this multiplexer. So how could the multiplexer idea um, explain reference ring transformations? That's the question we're gonna look at next. So here's the basic idea. Uh, and I think, you know, we, this came up from talking, you know, 
with Subatai and others, and, and, and we, we actually, in our Slack chat this last week, I, I talked about this idea. So just, just gonna um, try to put it in a picture to it as best I can. Imagine you have a patch of retina. It's a small patch of retina, and you have a cortical column that is getting input from that patch of retina. Um, well, actually, it could be, if it's the manual cellular cells, it would be a bigger patch of retina. And now imagine I have four thalamocortical cells. So these are magno. These are the ones that, that we, we think are gonna be doing flow detection. So um, we have, uh, I'm showing four magnocellular um, uh, thalamocortical cells. And we're gonna say that each of these cells is gonna represent um, a movement in this patch of retina in some particular direction. So if the things are moving to the left in a particular patch of retina, then this cell is gonna fire. And things are moving to the up, but this cell is gonna fire and so on. But actually, but that's not really, I, I, that was a misstatement. That's, that's how we think of it. But actually we want this to represent, uh, take that back, <laughs> sorry about that. We want these cells to actually represent the flow relative to the object being modeled by the column. So I, I said it here, right? Relative to the object in the world, an allocentric flow. Yet we need to detect the flow relative to the patch of retina. And so these down here, um, I'm showing for each of these thalamocortical cells, I'm showing the, the sort of the representation of four dendrites. So these, these little blocks are representing dendrites on this cell. These four represent dendrites in this cell, these four represent dendrites in these cells. And independently, the dendrites are getting input from the retina and the dendrites represent, um, this is what I should have said, the dendrites represent flow in a particular direction in the retinal center coordinates. So this dendrite will become active when, um, when the flow is moving to the left on the retinal patch. And this one when flow is moving up on the retinal patch and this one flows moving down the retinal patch. But all four of these project to this cell and this cell represents when flow is moving to the left in the object point of view. And so you can map different directions of flow on, a, uh, on these different dendrites. So this is, uh, this is uh, retinal centric flow to uh, object centric flow by enabling or disabling um, different dendrites. So now the basic idea is the cortical column from the, its layer 6A cell sends feedback to the cortex, this blue line. And the idea is that this layer 6 feedback enables individual dendrites on each thalamic cortical cell. So this, this will say under some context, I want you to pass up you know, this information or this information or that information. So under a different context, I might enable different dendrites. Um, uh, and so in this case, I would say, well, when the flow information is moving in this direction on the retinal pack, I want to report it as moving this direction to the cortex. So in some sense, I've rotated 90 degrees um, uh, clockwise. And same thing here. So, okay, when it's going to the left on the cortex, I want it to be going to hold till the, the I mean, left on the retina, I want it to be going vertical on the cortex to the cortex or to the object. Um, and so you can, you can basically take these flow patterns and you can, you can rotate them any way uh, you want in any particular point. And so over the entire cortex, you could be rotating all these flow patterns. And therefore the movements that are detected in the world um, relative to the retina can be, can be translated into movements relative to the object being observed. Uh, that's the basic idea. Um, no one said anything yet. So let me stop here for a second and see if I have questions or thoughts and comments. So Jeff, um, this uh, this last idea you just proposed here, since um, you, you said you spoke to a lot of people, but no one knows exactly what the uh, TC cells are doing, it sounds like there's going to be a long wait before we can confirm this, right? Um, not necessarily. To say you don't know some, what it's doing does not mean we don't have a lot of empirical data. Uh, when I say the plumber doesn't know what it's doing, it means like they have no theoretical understanding of why it's there. Um, so, you know, in some way you can say that the thalamus is a black box, but in the other way you could say there are hundreds, probably thousands of empirical data papers on the thalamus. So there's a hell of a lot of data there. It's unbelievable. I used to, I think I got rid of it, but I used to have a two volume book on the thalamus that was written like 20 years ago by, um, uh, what's his name? I can't remember now. Um, but you know, that was hundreds of papers just on thalamus, but it, there's so much data about this. But no one knows what it what the data means. That's so you, it's not it's not true to say we could in some sense verify this theory. Um, uh, also, I, I guess as I wrote in the in the Thousand Brains and I've talked about many times, if we can come up with a system that is copacetic with all the known details, uh, physiological and anatomical details in the thalamic cortical system, and that that very complex system does exactly what we need this complex system to do. That is, we have a mapping between 
a, a very detailed theoretical requirements and very detailed empirical results, then you almost be certain it's correct. It's just because if you know, you're solving so many constraints at the same time. So I think this is, I don't think this is untestable. I think this is quite testable. I think we can get to a point, uh, there's certainly a lot of data and I'll talk about some in a moment here that already conflicts with this idea. So I'm already we're able to test it already. I'll show that in a second. All right, thanks. I guess it's worth pointing out probably that, I mean, a lot of the data is with, without active movement. And in that case, you couldn't really, dis, you, you wouldn't be able to make this distinction, right? You wouldn't be able to tease it apart if there's no, if only the object is moving in the world and, and the animal is head fixed and, you know, their eyes are fixed and stuff, you couldn't really tease this apart, right? Yeah. You need some sort of active movement. Uh, exactly. To do it. And, and so this, this is a constant um, problem with interpreting empirical data is that so many of the results are, are not incorrect, but they're skewed by the experimental setup um, to hide what's actually going on, um, which I'm gonna to get to right in a second here, unless someone has more questions. But I will say with our, our model is pretty consistent, uh, yeah, consistent is not the right word. Like it, it the, you know, Carmen, and I think the, the anatomy and physiology suggests that this is very possible. You know, whether it actually does it or not is a different, but this sort of, Multiplexing is is very. I think you know it's very suggestive that it can do this. Yeah, I think you know the interesting the idea of it doing multiplexing. I think came came along before we even talked to Carmen, if I recall. I mean, it, 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 in my mind, it was like, hey, given this idea that there's these, you know, as they said earlier, that there's these, you know, uh, relays, a single spike type of thing. That says, well, there's only so many things you can do with a relay like that, you know. And um, my original idea was going to be using those uh, triadic synapses, and and I'd forgotten that that we disproved that. But last week we talked about that, and that was not right. But then in the in the poster that Superside went over last week, there was the alternate proposal about the different dendrites getting in and out of these uh, um, different states, and which does fit with it. So even there, I think the original idea of multiplexing came before we even knew a, a mechanism for doing it. And then we looked at it, it was one of the proposals we had, at least one of the proposals I'd thought about for many years. And, um, and then we looked at the details by talking to Carmen and others, and they said, hey, maybe it really does fit. It fits out, it, it could explain it. So um, anyway, but you'll see in a moment, there's testable hypotheses here. So yeah, one question I have uh, early in the presentation, you had kind of kind of a fork in the road where you had two two things you could choose between, uh, and and I feel like you took the opposite one that I would have naturally taken, and that's when you have the picture of the of the diagram, how some of the some of that is motor command, some of it is sensory, the the various lo levels of hierarchy, and there must be something wrong with that picture. I agree, uh, but you pushed in the direction of everything must be a motor command or a movement. And I would have pushed more in the direction of everything must be sensory. Uh, I don't actually, I, I don't think that. Um, I didn't think everything might be motor. I'm only talking about the motor part. Um, okay. Clearly there is motor and sensory in, in, the, in LGN, right? And what I would like to get to is you'd have motor and sensory here too in the high order ones. I, I think you need both. I see. Um, I'm only, in fact, but it's harder. I don't know how to make the, the, the this a lot of moving parts here. I don't really know how to make the sensory part transform happen. Um, if I try to work through the details, I, it doesn't work for me yet. Um, and um, so I don't know how to do that. So I'm just focused on the one part right now, not to the, because the exclusion of the other one, because it, the other one has to occur. I just don't know how to make it occur yet. So. <laughs> It's just to go to that point a little bit further. If you look at this diagram, it's very, it's very interesting. We have these else, these layer six cells, which are controlling the thalamus in some sense, but they're also making these massive projections to layer four. And so, so what the hell's going on there, right? Um, it's like, and and is it possible that? that this is a two-stage transformation, that the same cells here, well, let's say these cells represent sort of orientation of the object to the, to the, to the sensor. Let's, let's just make a stab like that. Well, okay, that orientation was, that would be the signal I would need to, to run this transform I'm talking about in the thalamus, but it would also, in theory, could be doing some similar transform up in layer four. In fact, this idea that, this idea that different dendrites could be representing um, different, movement vectors and that they're enabled or disabled independently 
um, could apply to a lot of neurons. It, uh, in fact, I think it's almost definitely going to apply in, under this scenario. It has to apply to the layer five um, output neurons. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so just going to point, it's, it's so damn complicated because maybe the, I can't figure out, I can, I can work myself through how the magnocellular cells, if they represented flow bits, could then lead to representing movement vectors in the cortex and outputting movement vectors. I do not today know how to do the parvocellular cells, which represent the sensory data, how they get transformed um, into layer four. I do, it doesn't work quite the same way. I, I can't just rotate a line. If I have like a, if, imagine I have a line or a, a feature, a line, a feature that says, oh, this is the edge of the dog. Well, I can't rotate all the edges of the dog 90 degrees and still have a dog, right? <laughs> that doesn't work. I can rotate the flow bits that way and I still have my movement commands, but I can't rotate the, 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 the edges of the dog. Each, each edge can't be rotated 90 degrees because then I'd have a, a messed up dog. <laughs> if you follow what I'm saying. So I don't know how to do the, the, the parvo side of the side yet, but ideally in the end, I, I would love it if, if we can explain how passing, you know, why we have to pass both types through here, how both types get um, um, uh, converted uh, properly. Another thing to consider, Marcus, is that we still have the connections from layer three to layer four that were shown in the earlier thinkings of the cortex. So it's possible that the sensory data has to go through the thalamus the first time, but doesn't have to go to thalamus the second time. <laughs> I don't know why, I, I, it is possible that's the case. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, I, I'm not picking winners yet. It's, it's just too many balls in the air at this point. But I am- maybe to, add, maybe to add to the confusion and the complexity, <laughs> the, in, the, in the circuit you showed there, uh, it looks like what the layer six say cells might be doing is controlling whether these TC cells fire in tonic mode or burst mode. Well, that's the, that that's is the, the, that is that's your, the control. That's, that's your, that's your implementation of the, of the thalamic gating, right? I mean, of the dendritic gating. It, yeah. It looks like that's what the dendrites are doing. They can control whether the cell bursts or is in tonic mode. So that's the way, yeah. it, it, that's the signal that would get sent back up to the cortex. And the other, I guess the other thing we have, Carmen and I haven't talked at all about oscillatory stuff or any sort of modulation of the oscillations or synchronization or anything like that. So that's another kind of yeah. Well, we independent of this, we've talked about other roles for the thalamus. We've talked about the matrix cells in the thalamus doing um, timing, and we've also talked about uh, the theta oscillations between the thalamus and the cortex controlling um, speed, right? And I think those are. I think those are also also going on. I just didn't talk about those today, right? Today I'm just focusing on this specific pathway, the magnocellular pathway. And could we be doing a movement reference frame transform? Um, you know, basically, and I can make that work. I think I, I think I can make this whole thing work, um, where I could say a movement. I can take a movement in one direction and transfer it into a movement in another direction. I um, mean, you know, movement in a reference frame of my. Of, of one reference frame to a movement in a different reference frame. The rest of it, I can't make work yet. Um, Jeff, do you think the um, the part where it, where it comes back to the uh, thalamus again, the circuit, that the second time it comes back and every other uh, subsequent time that it's a redundant connection? What do you mean? Are you saying the second time like in this next column here? No, I mean uh, in like the second circle there. So say, could it, could it be that the entire reference frame transformation is done in that in that very first um, TC cell on the left, right there where your cursor is? Yeah. And then uh, and the other times it's not really doing anything. No, I don't think so at all. Um, the, way to, the way I think about this, Karan, is that every column is doing the same thing. That's the, that's the, the Mount Castle proposal, right? Common core column. And, and, and as you, it, it, every column doesn't know what its inputs are. In fact, columns get their inputs from all over the place. Uh, you know, an individual um, region in the cortex doesn't just get, you know, V1, V2 doesn't get just input from V1. <laughs> um, you know, in, in fact, you know, some of these cortical regions get input from seven or so other regions at the same time. So there's a huge mix of stuff going on here. And so all you can say is that any particular column, let's say there's one I've labeled V2 here, it doesn't know what its inputs represent. It's going to build its own model of the world, and it can't assume any knowledge about anyone else's model of the world. It just can't know anything else is going on. It just can't know it. 
He says, okay, I'm gonna get some inputs. Those inputs are gonna represent some sort of um, spatial pattern and a movement in some space. And I'm gonna build a model of that. So if you just assume that there's this ignorance that's going on between all these different columns, and this goes on for dozens of, dozens of regions in the cortex, we can't assume there's a similar transform, that the same transform can be used everywhere. In some sense, you have to start over again, which is, which is interesting because I wanna to get to in a second here, this, see this layer five output? Well, my assumption is this is back into an egocentric reference frame. That if, if the layer, if V1 or V2 are gonna control the eye movement, it's gonna to have to do it in, it's gonna to have to send a signal back down to some part of the brain where it says, you know, um, you know I, I, I'm moving my eye, you know, from the, from the center of my cell phone to the, to, the, to the power button. But to do that, you need to move the eye, you know, left to right or something like that. And so this has to be, this motor output here has to be an egocentric. These inputs have to be egocentric. And, and so what you're actually feeding into this next column is a motor command that's an egocentric motor command. It's not, it's, it hasn't been, it's no longer in the, in the reference frame of the object. Um, so uh, it's, it just says, okay, this, this column on its own says, okay, I get some input, I transfer, I model the system, I make motor outputs, the motor outputs are gonna be an egocentric reference frame, I need to do that. And then it says, the next column says, okay, I'm independently getting some egocentric movement data and um, I'm gonna, you know, and, and some sensory data and I'm gonna uh, model it and make an output. So I think they all have to be independent. They all have to be doing their own thing. Everyone has to learn, every single column has to learn what these blue cells represent and how they control the, their, their region of the thalamus. That would be my assumption. Why don't I just go on and, and talk about some uh, issues? And I just wrote these, uh, I already said this here. Uh, so the layer six feedback enables individual dendrites on in each slime or cortical cell. And Subutai was saying that's done to this, uh, this um, uh, bursting uh, mode, tonic versus bursting. Um, and I said, okay, here's how you could remap them. So there are some issues here. And I just thought, I, I just, these literally I wrote down 10 minutes before the, uh, the meeting. Um, these thalamocortical cells here are all reported to have center surround or center on, center off receptive fields. They're not reported to have flow. They don't report to have movement direction. It's, it's like, you know, and, and that's a problem for this theory. I need these cells to represent um, movement. I can't just represent center or surround um, responses. So for this theory to work, that observation has to be wrong. And, uh, and I said here, could that be an example of experimental setup? So as Supertai said earlier, if I took an, an animal and I anesthetized it, or even worse, if I took a, a, a brain slice and I'm doing this in a, in a Petri dish, you know, which sometimes they do this, um, you know, what's going to happen with these cells? What, what's going to happen with these dendrites? Is one going to be enabled or one not going to be enabled? Well, one of the possibilities is that they're all enabled. So imagine all these dendrites are enabled. Uh, they all would pass information through. So what would this cell response look like? Well, it would, just, it would respond no matter which way the movement and flow is occurring. And that might look like a center surround receptive field. You would say, yeah, well, I, and you can think of that this way. You can think of center surrounds receptive field as a union of all the possible movements. It's sort of saying like, I don't know which movement's going on. Um, I'm not sure which movement, I, I'm not sure how I should orient my movement. So I'm gonna respond no matter which way it's moving. It's a, it's a union of all possible movements, but maybe only under an intentional gaze of the animal actually looking at something and saying, oh yeah, I'm looking at a coffee cup would these things be enabled? And then you would see, then you would see the cell have a, a, an orientation preference. You would say, oh, that's gonna represent flow in a particular direction. I, I think this comes from, um, and I, I also think this is an outdated view now, uh, but I think it comes from retinal ganglion cells having uh, center surround properties. And I think that, that that's, one of the reasons they thought these were relay cells, they're just kind of mimicking the response properties uh, of interesting. That's right, retinal interesting. ganglion right. cells. Yeah, so if you think that the, the inputs to the, um, to, the, um, uh, to the cortex are, are these retinal ganglion cells that are center surround, and we think that there's relays, then you'll assume that the output cells are going to be center surround. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think there's, there, there are a lot of ganglion cells which are center surround. Yeah. But, but I you thought know, I saw... But I thought I saw a paper where they said that 
that it's a more recent paper, that's a pretty, that is the traditional view, but they found that the, the retinal cells are much more sophisticated than that. There are many, many different types yeah. of response properties. And then those are then, you know, feed back up to the thalamus. So there, there could be and included in that is flow and, and yeah. things like that. Also, you know, as, as we talked about last week, if you look at these, um, these, these thalamic cortical cells, these guys here, and as, as Sherman reported, they have about 6,000 synapses, about 15% of them are driver from the retina. So that means they're getting, each of these cells is getting about 900 synapses from retinal ganglion cells. That certainly doesn't sound like a, 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 a relay, does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the retinal ganglion cells, aren't those the direct drivers of the uh, axons down the optical nerve? Yeah, so right. So, there's, so, if, so if they could only have center surround, you know, why would you have the whole amacrine layer, you know, looking for edges and stuff? Well, it turns out that actually the retinal ganglion cells, in, my, in this theory here, the retinal ganglion cells could still be center surround. But imagine each of these dendrites. Now, there might be more than four here, right? I've only showed four because it's the only one to draw. But you know, it depends on where you, you take the branching point. But there could be more. There could be easily, there could be you know, 15 or so of these, these things here. Each one is going to get hundreds of, of, of um, inputs from the retina. And even if those inputs from the retina were sent us around, these dendrites could easily recognize a, a that by looking at a pattern of those um, inputs from the retina, could the dendrites could then say, oh, I'm going to respond to a flow of these centers around in a particular direction. Well, I understand in principle you could do that, but it doesn't explain the complexity of, of the retina. And, you know, it's like if everything devolves down to things just have a center surround, why bother having five layers in the thing? Well, yes, obviously that's correct. And as soon as I point out, there is these, well, there's a ton of stuff that's going on in terms of light balancing and um, in two. Yeah, the center surround is somewhat outdated now. They're saying that there yeah. are as many as 30 different types of response properties yeah. or potentially more in the retina. Yeah, in the retina. I, I'm just saying from first principles, it was a dumb idea. Yeah, yeah. But but I don't well. <laughs> I don't I don't want to make a I don't want to make a stand. This theory does not require that the retinal ganglion cells um, have flow or directional sensitivity. It's it's totally copacetic with it, but doesn't require it because it can be detected in the dendrites themselves. So this theory makes no statement about that. Um, but it does make a statement that the thalamocortical cells must represent flow and cannot be center surround under normal attentive conditions. Um, so we can, we can accommodate what's, whatever happens going on in the retina because we've got all these converging inputs onto these, retina, onto these dendrites. But so that we, we're, um, we're ambivalent about. But we can't be ambivalent about here that, that we can't we can't be the each, the each dendrite has to represent flow and each um, cell then has to represent flow. Anyway, I think it's quite possible that you could still observe these cells, these these thalamocortical cells, as having center surround response properties, um, only because they're on, they're testing under conditions where none of the you know there hasn't been a selection of which dendrites are responsible, and so if all dendrites are reporting correctly. Uh, they're all responding, then the cell will look like a center surround. It will respond to a flow in any direction. Therefore, it's not flow sensitive. <laughs> it's not directional sensitive. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a very, getting back to uh, Karan's early point, that's a very testable hypothesis. You know, you, you could easily probe these cells and say, yeah, we're looking for flow patterns and we're looking for a directional sensitivity that changes under context um, as the object being viewed changes. So it's very testable um, theory. And there might be data about that already. The second, that's a big issue. The second issue we've already talked about is like what's happening in the parvocellular pathway as, as Marcus brought up. Um, the same mechanism could work for changing the orientation of features that in, in, in uh, you know, static features in the input. But that, as I point out, that isn't sufficient. You can't rotate, it's, it's, it's only part of the problem. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I haven't thought about it sufficiently, but it, it's, it's clearly, this, it's more complicated here. Um, but ideally that would be nice. It would be nice that, you know, we're, we, we got these relay cells, they, they exist in all the different layers in the thalamus. So there's relay cells in the parvocellular pathways. They should be doing something similar. Um, and so they probably are, but we, that alone does not seem to be sufficient to really solve the uh, problem of, of, uh, orient, of, of 
of orientation, you know, reference frame transforms for visual objects, you know. Maybe it doesn't, I just haven't thought about it clearly yet. Um, uh, I already pointed out that layer 6A cells also project to layer 4, which is very suggestive, saying, hey, maybe, maybe layer 4 is doing something similar to what's going on in the thalamus. Maybe, and remember, these cells in layer 4 are these, um, they're not pyramidal cells. They're these stellate cells, which, which appear throughout the brain and the, throughout the cortex and, uh, and the hippocampal formation in very specific parts. So they, they, and so maybe there's something going on there. Maybe these cells really... Um, are, are doing part of the transform, the, uh, the, uh, the layer four stellate cells. It, it could do translation transform. They will, couldn't do orientation or rotation. Uh, but it could do a little bit true. of translation. It's true. So maybe that would help. Uh, yeah, although I'm not sure. That's interesting. I have to think about that. Okay, good point. Uh, we still need to do orientation though, <laughs> so, but uh, we'll have to get back yeah, to that. Yeah, one. orientation is weird, yeah. puzzling. <laughs> you know, it's it's a little bit, remember I used to, when we were in the conference room in the office, um, I used to run my finger along the edge of the, the, the eraser um, panel at the bottom of the whiteboard. And as I, and as I ran my finger along it, my, my thumb along it, my thumb would rotate as I ran it along it. And, and I said to myself, my perception I don't perceive that change as my thumb is, the orientation of my thumb is changing as it going along this edge. And so the pattern of my thumb is changing. My perception is that I have this line, this edge, it's straight and consistent and not changing in front of me. It's like, it's like, it's, it's somehow we go right to having this constant horizontal edge in front of me. And I don't change, I don't have, I don't sense the changing pattern of my thumb. And so it could, it could explain something like that. Um, I think um, it could say, Hey, you know what? I've got. Um, it could do that. See that, but that's not the whole object. That's just like some edge. It could be transferring an edge. Uh, it could be rotating an edge that so says, "I'm going to pass information into the cortex, saying this, there's a horizontal edge out here, and it's just it's horizontal and it's it's staying horizontal even though your thumb is moving around, something like that." Uh, the last thing is something else that we just we already talked about briefly here, is that these these layer five um, motor cells the ones that project subcortically and the ones that also project to the higher order thalamic relay zones. Um, they have to go back to being egocentric orientation. I mentioned that here. I have to, if, if under this scenario, all the processing going on in a cortical column is in the reference frame or the orientation of the object being modeled. So I've converted somehow my inputs into the, to the object reference frame. The processing is all occurring in the object reference frame. I now have a motor output, but the motor output has to be converted back into an egocentric reference frame. So to achieve a certain goal relative to the object means uh, I move, I make a movement relative to the object, but then I have to convert that in the movement relative to the, the, the effector of the motor, or the body, if you will. So, and this is not going back through the thalamus. There's no equivalent here. So, but it did occur to me that these layer five cells that, um, that do this, they are noted because they have this very unusual physiological property. They're called intrinsically bursting cells. And similar to the cells in the thalamus, they have a sort of a bursting in a tonic mode. And so it's possible that they're doing the exact same thing as these cells down here, but they're doing it up here. That is, the, it's possible that the dendrites on these layer five cells are representing movement in the allocentric, object-centric reference frame. But then I map it to a specific movement in the egocentric reference frame by enabling one of those dendrites. Um, and so, because that has to occur as far as I'm concerned, it just has to happen someplace. And, and so, it's, uh, so that's a nice little uh, twist that you see this similar type of bursting tonic mode in these cells as you see down here, which could imply that the same mechanisms are being used to do the reverse transform from an allocentric to an egocentric here versus from an egocentric to an allocentric here. So that's another thing that's required of this theory. Um, um, and, and if all this seems super, super complicated, just, just keep in mind that it has to occur. <laughs> these, these things have to occur. It's not like we have an option here. And so they're gonna occur someplace. Um, so um, uh, it's not like, oh, this is a bad idea. We don't need to do this. No, we gotta do this. Um, so we have to find the mechanisms for doing it. Um, so I, I'm still pretty intrigued by this whole idea. The idea here is that the, it, it provides for the first time as, uh, a really, really central role for what, why every cortical column has a patch of thalamus associated with it. And 
what is going on there. It says every cortical column has to take some input, translate it into a local reference frame, process it, and then pass it back out in the, in the original reference frame. And, um, and so that's a, it's a nice, it's, a, it's really the first time we have a, that I've known of that there's a real purpose for the thalamus. It's, it's like, the, I, I have no other hypothesis. There's other thing else that people talk about, it's very fuzzy, oh, tension and this and that, but there's nothing really tangible you can wrap your fingers around and say, yeah, what is that damn thing doing? You know, why is it so important? You know, if you lose your thalamus, you're, you're a vegetable. Um, so it's a, it's a critical role in the whole system. And we need, a, we need a critical function for it. And reference frame transformation just strikes me as like, oh, that's a beautiful thing if it did it. It's just a beautiful singular purpose that every column needs to do and there's a mechanism for it. Um, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons it exists uh, along with the other things we talked about earlier. So that's it, that's, that's all the pages I have today. So one one part when you talked about the parvo and how the if you rotate the coffee cup is going to give you like a really messed up coffee cup. Uh, yeah. I I think um, I think uh, if you spend five more minutes thinking about this, you'll you'll realize that that's the wrong way of thinking of it. Like I think uh, so. So I let me let me say back to you what I, I think. So, I was hoping, budget, Marcus. I was hoping you were going to say or someone was going to say. Oh, you're wrong, Jeff. It really does work. So maybe you're going to do that. So well, that's, like, basi that's basically what I'm doing. Oh, good, good. I want to hear it. I, 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 I mean, I, couldn't, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but it's on the surface. I kept getting confused by it. Like, I can't figure this out. It strikes me as you're thinking about it too quickly. Uh, and just, just pausing for a second. If you picture like, here's what I think your mental model is. Like picture a four by four grid of cortical columns and the coffee cup is kind of landing on it, yeah. uh, la landing in that grid. And you're saying it's a, it's a problem if you take all of the 16 squares of that grid and rotate them. Oh, I, I know what you're going to say now. I got it. You're right. You're going to say, that's not what we do. We take each of, each of those little interval segments we assign to a, a location or a reference frame. And, and that still works. Is that what you're going to say? Maybe. Let me say oh, okay. it and see if the, this is what, okay. the, like, what actually happens is like when the coffee cup lands on this four by four grid, yeah. if it rotates, now, yes, I, th I think this is what you were what you're yes. thinking. I would say that then now every part of cortex is going to predict what it senses, but its task is now easier because its input features are rotated. But its computational computational task can still benefit from re rotating what's in its square. In fact, in fact, I think I, I think just hearing you talk about this, it all became clear to me in, in an instant. Um, I just I made this stupid, stupid mistake. The, the beauty of the thousand brains theory is that each column looks only a teeny part of the world and nobody has to assemble it into an image, right? All they have to do is say this teeny part of the world is at some location in a reference frame and this teeny part of the world is some location in a reference frame and this being some location reference. No one reassembles the image anywhere. And so I think what you're saying, well, this is what popped in my head when you were just talking, was that the whole thousand brains theory says, yeah, I don't need to reassemble. There's nobody looking at this image. If, in fact, if it's like, yeah, if, you, if I were to look at the cortex, I'd see all these rotated lines, but no one's looking at the dog. And so each rotated line on each column is basically saying, is this the right thing I should be seeing at this location on the object? And the answer could be yes. It's, it's I, I fell for the, 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 the fallacy that there's a recreated image in the brain. I think that's what you were saying. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but I'm not sure what that, how does that relate to the thalamus and, and well, it just means that I can, I can, I can rotate, I can take a vertical line. Uh, I can take, a, let's take, take my thumb, right? I can take um, um, a, 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 an edge that's going across my thumb, you know, take off and stop sharing here. Let me show my thumb. I take a line that's going across my thumb and that's, that's running along the edge of the, the whiteboard eraser contain, uh, tray, right? And, um, uh, where it's, it's, on, it's on this coffee cup here, right? And I say, okay, um, but now I rotate my thumb and I got the different impression. But what's being passed to the cortex, just take this one, what's being passed to the cortex, even though it's changing on my thumb, the cortex is getting the same input. The cortex is saying relative to the cup, there's a line horizontal relative to the cup. It doesn't, and as I'm rotating this, the different dendrites on those cells are changing. So it's, it's changing an, an edge on my thumb, uh, relative to my thumb into a different edge relative to the, to the object. And so the, there's a constant 
projection to the cortex saying there's an edge relative to the coffee cup, even though this one is changing. So it, I think that's it. Does that make sense? Marcus is shaking. Gets to, yeah, so this gets to a question I had about like what if we could run the ideal experiment, what would we do and what would we expect to see? And here, just to use that example, if you're if you're feeling a particular edge and you actively rotate your thumb, then the input to the cortex or the response the output uh, from the yeah. cortex should be should be pretty stable with respect to the, yes. I, I think the it would be like if I could look at the um, layer four cells, first of all, let's start there. If I were to look at the layer four cells and their response properties, they say, oh, these cells are edge, edge sensitive. But that what edge they the actual edge that they detect should change. Um, uh, let's put it this way: it should be stable as the thumb moves. As the yeah, thumb rotates, it should be stable as, should, as you actively move. But if someone yeah. were to move the cup externally, then you wouldn't get that stability, right? Yeah, if I so if, um, have to be due to active movement. Uh, I think if you I, see I, the cup I, rotating, you could make a case that could do it too. Yeah, I'd have to think about that. Yeah, the, yeah. I guess here I was assuming the only sensation would be somatosensory, yeah. just as an example. Yeah, you yeah. Know, if you this, have other, then it gets more. You know, if you other. in the there's so much data on uh, these response properties in layer four cells and in, in the visual cortex that, um, and nobody, as far as I know, has reported this that those cells, let's say layer four cells. There, the mapping between the retinal edge and the and the edge, uh, the response properties of layer four cells would be changing under different um, perceptual states. Like if I'm looking at the coffee cup, and I'm trying, my I tell you, your goal is to move your eyes along the edge of the coffee cup. Um, well, then I would think that, and, and then I turn my head, rotate my head like this. So the input on my retina is changing as I do this. But my perception is that it's stable here, so that means I would I would expect the retinal output be rotating, uh, but I wouldn't expect the layer four cells to be rotating. That is, the same layer four cells would be responding, and I don't think that's I am not aware that's ever been reported in the literature, which makes me a little nervous about this theory because boy, that's a pretty big difference for, for you know dozens or hundreds of papers that have talked about this that no one. Yeah, but up. that's why I was bringing up this active movement thing. Is it's like ninety nine percent of the papers out there have passive movement, not active movement. Mm. And well, the the papers that what I've seen that do have active movement, basically what they say is that all hell breaks loose. They can't predict anything anymore. Um, and the static right? properties don't hold anymore. Is that right? So well, people... I, know, I knew that in, in context, we knew that in context, some of these cells would be, would drop out, right? We talked about that in terms of the sequence memory. But um, yeah, yeah. but but the idea that they remap, is that true? I mean, like all of a sudden the cell we thought was a, a horizontal line. Exactly. Of yeah, all of the static properties seem to just get really confused. All right, so here's a, here's a very succinct experiment. You have a monkey and, and the monkey is looking at an object like this coffee cup and is in, attending to it. And then the monkey turns his head left and right, right? We know that the, the pattern on the retina is gonna change. We know that in the classic view, the layer four cells should change. But in this view, the layer four cells should be stable. That would be the first step. Um, I, I would I'd go be a, a little more precise. It's, it's only the layer four cells that are at the point of rotation. Uh, I'd say all the rest of the layer four cells are going to change because a different part of the image is going to land on it. Or oh, that's right. Yes. Similarly yeah, yeah, right. with the thumb, a yeah, different yeah, part yeah, of yeah, the yeah, edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you're right. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's you really have to incorporate the 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 um point of rotation. Yes, the, the, right. the point that the rotation is about. Yeah. Um, although I would argue that if I had already characterized the other cells that are not at the point of rotation, and I already had my classic receptive field for them, based on sinusoidal gradings or something like that that the response to those other cells that are now getting the edge, I've rotated my head. So now there's some cells in my, in my retina and in my cortex that didn't have any input before, but now we're getting input, that that input would not match their classic receptive field. That input would say uh, it's different than the classic receptor. So you could measure it there too. Um, so you'd have to characterize the cells first and then you can see it. Yes, this, uh, so getting back, I think it was Karan's question. There's a lot of ways you could test this. In fact, maybe it's already out in the literature there already. So <laughs> there's just so many damn papers to look at. Um, 
I, you know, this is really, I, I call this a proposal and I'm not really certain about it, but it's certainly, it really feels good. It's just like, oh, I really want this to be true. Um, it just has so much going for it. It's better than the other proposals I've been looking at by far. Um, doesn't mean it's right, but it makes you want to make it right. So anyway, that's it for today. That's all I had to present on this. Maybe we can come up with an experiment that, that Karma would be interested in helping with this to, to test this. I mean, it, it, I think it would be a pretty dramatic discovery if, if we propose this and if we prove that it's actually happening. Um, at, uh, in the neuroscience world, that'd be pretty big. <laughs>